Hi, everyone. I'm Joanna Yaz, Readings and Special Programs Manager of the NYU Creative Writing Program. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to hear John Freeman and Khaled Matawa read and discuss writing in a time of crisis. Sorry, I'm letting a couple of stragglers in while I'm introducing, I'm doing, wearing a couple of hats here. Writing in the time of crisis, <laughs> certainly an apt topic this year. The program will be as follows. I will introduce both writers. They'll then talk a bit, after which Khaled will read. Then John and Khaled will talk some more, followed by John's reading. After that, we'll have a Q&A where you'll have a chance to ask questions via the chat. While the authors are reading and talking, I ask that you keep yourselves muted, but encourage you to keep your cameras on and to use the chat to share your reactions. I'll be intermittently posting links related to John and Khaled's work, including links to purchase their books. In the spirit of resistance, which I'm guessing might run through tonight's event, none of the linked booksellers will be Amazon. I'll now, now tell you a little bit about each of our readers. Excuse me, hold on. Born and raised in Benghazi, Libya, Khaled Matawa relocated to the U.S. as a teenager in 1979. He is the author of six books of poetry and a critical study of the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. Matawa has co-edited two anthologies of Arab American literature and translated numerous volumes of contemporary Arabic poetry. His work has appeared in numerous magazines and anthologies, including Tales of Two Planets, edited by tonight's John Freeman. Khaled's many awards include the Academy of American Poets Fellowship Prize, a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, the Penn Award for Poetry and Translation, several Pushcart Prizes, and a MacArthur Fellowship. Matawa served as Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets from 2014 to 2020. He currently teaches in the Graduate Creative Writing Program at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. His latest poetry collection, Fugitive Atlas, out next week from the wonderful Gray Wolf Books, was just today described by Plowshares as a powerful reminder that the migrant crisis is an ongoing reality with profound effects on those who suffer directly from displacement and on humanity at large. John Freeman is a longtime editor, formerly of Granta, now the founder of Freeman's, a literary annual of new writing, and executive editor of LitHub. He has also edited a trilogy of anthologies I've heard referred to as an atlas of inequality, comprised of tales of two Americas, stories of inequality in a divided nation, Tales of Two Cities, which is about New York City, and Tales of Two Planets, which features writers from around the world on the climate crisis. He is artist, resident, artist, artist in residence at NYU, where we're so happy to have him teaching our graduate students in the creative writing program. John's books include How to Read a Novelist, The Tyranny of Email, and Dictionary of the Undoing, as well as two collections of poems, maps, and The Park, published this past May by Copper Canyon, which the millions called a fascinating consideration of the park as a place of preserved wilderness. Layers abound in these considerations of wild spaces. We're delighted and honored to host Khaled Matawa and John Freeman tonight for what I know will be a fascinating reading and conversation. Thank I will you. now hand off the virtual mic to you both. Thank you so much, uh, Joanna. And it's so nice to be here with you, Khaled. Um, I have learned so much uh, about poetry from your numerous translations, but I've enjoyed also your, your own volumes and your, and your critical work. And we've done so much from, you know, you've made it possible for me once to speak to the poet Adonis in an interview. Um, and with this new book, I, I feel like you've helped me appreciate that a, a volume of poems can be a kind of mural um, in a time when it feels like uh, you would need a very large canvas uh, to make an atlas of, of the pain that's being felt in the world. I, and 
since a lot of our uh, guests, I assume, um, are writers of some sort and, and some of them students, I wanted to start by asking you, um, because your book is a kind of clinic of engagement, what the, the risks and possibilities of engagement are now, assuming that is that, let's just make some assumptions here. One, that art can only come from engagement. It, it cannot come from evading. Mm -hmm. um, and, and two, that the, the crisis uh, that we're describing is, is global. Um, it has to do with the environment, it has to do with the consolidation of power and wealth. It has to do with uh, and capitalism. Um, and it also, in your case, um, uh, is, is very specifically related to the Libyan civil war that began in 2014 and is ongoing. Um, so that being said, what, what are the risks and possibilities of engagement now? And, and, and how, do you, how do you do it? John, it's great to be with you and uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, I, I appreciate the invitation and seeing actually some of the names and so many friends uh, there. So uh, welcome and thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be with you tonight. And with you, John, I've, I, I would say like, when I was uh, like, w watching Granta in the 90s and collecting issues, I still I think of issues from the 80s. I don't know if you were the editor specifically then, but it's been one of my favorite magazines that I never got into. So uh, it remains a, a hurdle in my life that I haven't overcome. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's uh, so it's great to be with you and I appreciate your <clears throat> your time and generosity to, toward my work. Uh, the possibilities of engagement, I mean, I think there's two things. One is you have to sort of be called by the, by the, the, the issue, by the cause. Um, and and I, I have always, I, I mean, I've, in some ways, I don't mm, think of myself as a writer or at least a person who is committed to the page. I, I also like to edit and do other things and translate. So as a writer or somebody who's, who thinks I have something to say, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't really, I, I have to wait for it to happen. So if the engagement is really uh, with issues that are that are lingering in your mind and don't leave you. And, and some, some novelists are caught up with, with certain uh, characters that don't leave them and they have to write them out. The same thing with, uh, with that. And then I think there's a, a sort of maybe um, uh, um, um, uh, a, certain uh, a certain misconception. misconception. I'm echoing. I'm echoing. No, there's no reverb here. Okay, well, okay. I'll, I'll deal with it. I live with it. I think uh, I don't. I think that if, if engagement means that you that you realize that something will happen or hoping that something will take place out of your art, I think that that may be um, a kind of delusion that you have to let go of very soon. Or even the idea that art will or poetry will make something immediate or 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 will affect things uh, in a sort of a more immediate way. Things, um, um, how knowledge or consciousness is built uh, through art, if that's the, the way one is approaching it, it has to be um, kind of a, uh, something put out into the universe uh, and it is ultimately geared towards the mind and, and, and the intellect or the heart uh, in, in a deeper sense. And that's it's an investment in the human capacity to to uh, imagine the lives of others, uh, to um, engage with those lives, and in that sense, that was never. I mean, that's never going to disappear. You're not going to say, "Oh, let's solve this crisis with this poem." Uh, you're dealing with with uh, with 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 the nature of cruelty in general, and so the poem should speak to the moment now, but also should also have traces of the past and probably traces of the future. So um, it is an engagement with the human condition with a, with a, as wide a time frame as, as possible, uh, I, I imagine. There's some, something you just said is really interesting um, that popped into my head. It sort of coalesced around the phrase that um, uh, conscience is a muse. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, I've always felt that um, conscience can be, uh, as a concept, 
Mm -hmm. uh, difficult as a writer because it can so easily lead to just what you described, which is instrumental writing. And, and so to, to hone closer to the, the craft of, of how to um, move from uh, a spirit of engagement to the, hearing the call to, to actually doing it, your, your new book is, is really beautiful. Um, I'm going to hold it up again because I think this is an exceptional book. Uh, you, you described it as a kind of mural, but it's sort of like five books in one. It's a, it's a rolling atlas of, um, of a series of crises of, that, that have made people move, that have made people leave, that have poisoned people's waters uh, in, in various places around the world, from uh, Egypt to uh, Flint, Michigan, to, to Libya, to Palestine. Um, and, you know, one of the things I really love about this is just when the, you think the book is going to settle into a, a restricted um, time frame and a restricted voice, it, it sort of elides away from that. And I found myself when I was writing the park doing something similar where the park was originally set entirely on the Luxembourg Gardens and I was going to try to see as much through the, that park as possible. And then I found myself sort of sliding away from it um, and into other parks, a park in um, Bucharest, Romania, a park in um, Slovenia, uh, a park in, uh, in, in the Middle East during the middle of the quote unquote Arab Spring. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your decision to, mm -hmm. to make your atlas broad and if at any point in the, you had a, a smaller atlas, a more limited one, and, and why, why, why you, you kept the territory as big as it, as it wound up being. I, mean, I, I like what you're talking about, your, your book, in that uh, the poems, once you sort of get a sense of an idea, or maybe it is the way that an open space becomes a kind of shelter or a confessional, like I was just reading the poem about the woman crying in the park, then you, you I guess there's a way in which even as a lyric poet, you are testing your, your lyric impulses. And that's why I say, well, here's what I got. Let me see if I if it applies somewhere else. There is a kind of science to, to poetry in that the, the emo, you want to make sure that the sort of the emotional field you're engaging has verifiability. It's not like uh, it, it, so poetry is I guess is always about interrogated emotion or a discovery. And so you take that and you see if it applies somewhere else, and then you so you travel with it. Um, and I like I like the lyric as a as as an intellectual exercise as well as it is a sort of an impressionistic one. Um, you know, one of the uh, I guess one of the things I could have done, and I was just alluding to this earlier, is to just focus on the refugee crisis. That's the biggest section of the book, and um, I I felt like I didn't want it to be like a single project book. Uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, I've been sort of, if, as a witness, I've been witnessing this past decade from one and then finding like when it goes to uh, thinking about occupation, the roots of occupation are chronicled in Conrad, there's a Patrice Lumumba, there's, uh, you know, Native American experience as part of that, there's the Italian colonization of Libya and the genocide in the 1930s. So it, you, I can't talk about occupation and, and sort of not dig deeper and say it, it's really a part of a, an ideology and, uh, rather than just uh, one incident and one uh, situation. So you, you keep it just the, the and, and that's part of what causes a refugee crisis, what causes a sort of a, a disintegration. Today, actually, I was just listening to reading an article about how a, a Palestinian guy walked into a met with a, with a, with a, like a, you know, a social worker in Denmark. He's like a third generation Dane. And the social worker said, oh, we can give you $35,000 if you wish to go to the land of origin. Can you imagine this? Like Denmark is telling third generation Danes to go back to Palestine or Lebanon or whatever. I mean, that, I mean that's, that's somehow to me, that sort of connection to the idea of uh, displacement, that the Palestinian experience of displacement is, is continuing even after people have been third generation somewhere else. Like, oh, we're going to kick you out again. Uh, so these cycles of displacement, 
based on race, based on othering, are to be found everywhere. And I found myself meeting them in Libya, where, where the country has become a kind of a, a brutality uh, laboratory of people who had nothing to do with the migrant flow or crisis became involved in it. And so, uh, so it just, it, it, things were festering in, all around me for many, many reasons. And I felt like I needed to capture that. And in the meantime, I'm here in the United States and then the Flint thing happens and then other things happen and, and the water in Ann Arbor is becomes, so it's very hard to think, well, I, I'm only going to focus on this one project when even in the midst of it, I don't know if I can drink the water I'm drinking. So it, it had to all come together in, in, as, as a mural in that sense. The risks, the risks that you've taken it are really spectacular and they pay off and they, but they do continuously return poetry to the sort of felt experience. Um, you know, in order to do that, you, you write in the voice of characters. Mm -hmm. um, the, the section you just described, Fugitive Atlas, which is the longest, which is about the sort of migrant crisis across the Mediterranean. Many of those are um, psalms and uh, there's a calypso. There, there's, so there's a series of musical forms. Mm -hmm. um, there's the, the Palestine, um, sorry, the occupation poem you described as an index. Uh, and so you, you've come at this sort of challenge of, of how to make a mural by using lots of different ways of, of creating um, sonics and intimacy. Uh, but the, the one that's most striking to me is sort of speaking in the voice of other characters or um, telling the story of, of someone else, you know, and, and so the I and the voice in this book is a, is a both, is a kind of plural first person. And I, I found myself doing a little bit of that in the park, but there was a, a limit to which I could do it because I, I belong to the park in a very different way that, than you belong to Libya. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wonder if you can talk about you know, the, when you wrote these poems mm -hmm. and where you did, because I've heard through the grapevine of poets who talk about where other poets have gone as if we were a giant GPS system. And I'd heard that you'd gone back to Libya in, in, in around 2013. Um, and I was very curious to know, to see what was gonna happen with your work when you, when you did that. And then it was kind of quiet for a while because I realized you, you were writing this book but how much of the poems were written there? And, and you know, is, is that modality of, of kind of telling the stories of people who are not yourself or speaking in their voices, does it feel differently when you're physically, literally closer? Well, I, you know, I, I, I didn't witness a lot of the refugee crisis in Libya. We were involved with an arts organization, a cinema club, and, and, and so on. Uh, and so we were promoting the young artists. So, but then it began, the news began to come. Uh, and, and, uh, and, so, uh, and then the sense of responsibility, because a lot of these people were, were drowning, coming to the shores, the boats were horrible. Uh, even though, as you'll hear, while you are trying to build you know, maybe a new nation and sponsor artists and poets, you're know, realizing that, you know, half an hour from you, there are people being put on boats that are going to sink. So there's the kind of awareness of what, um, but that took some time to realize it's happening. Um, uh, I mean, after when I realized that at least that sequence, uh, I went, Libya is very difficult to actually look into those issues from there. But the stories were coming in, like where are the towns, how people were buying the boats and, and putting uh, uh, refugees in them. You know, I was following from the BBC reports and news and so on. Uh, uh, but then traveling, I think, to Lampedusa and to... Uh, uh, also Lesbos um, uh, was very important. The, the thing is, is that the, the migrant crisis is really from West Africa all the way to Iran, Pakistan, and Bangladesh even. That's how wide it is. And people, when, when, when it, you know, people in 2000, starting 2013, were coming, even some Bangladeshis and Eritreans and Senegalese were coming, all, you know, right smack middle of the Sahara through Libya. But then there were people who were flying from Brazzaville to Istanbul and then trying to get to, uh, to Greece 
uh, by those short distance boats. So it was all over. And then in, in Lesbos particularly, I, I saw people from, from everywhere. And, uh, and so it was combining this act of, of you know, seeing uh, and, and then thinking about drama. I mean, I really felt like I'm going to write mini dramas. I'm going to think of, of writing plays. I'm going to, um, you know, monodramas. And I felt like that's, I don't really need to think about being poetry. I just need to think about voice and, and, and dramatization. And yeah. so, I just want to hold this up because this is, this is a poem about um, Libya. It's about the 42 years of uh, Gaddafi's di dictatorship and you can see that it, it sort of lives on the page and, and sort of mm. kind of like suspended floating voices and I, I, that's what's really dramatic and new about this book to me within your work is the way that you have conjured a kind of panoply of voices and then set them in this um, mural which is also moving and floating like like a kind of drama and and these voices surge forth and, and when I hear you talk about the fact that you know, you weren't sort of walking down to talk to traffickers. It's, it's, it's both heartening and shocking to me because to read, especially the Fugitive Atlas section, when there is a, even a poem about a person that goes to Denmark as well. Um, there are poems about drowning, there are poems about, um, you know, being swindled. They do feel very intimate as if they've been told directly to you as if, you know, and if this were in a play, a, a, a person would step forward and a cone of light would be on just them. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm, I'm really amazed that you were able to do that through um, <laughs> the good old Beeb, um, as, <laughs> as well as obviously having a heart. Um, I, maybe, maybe it's time for you to read some of them um, okay. rather than have me just talk about them. Well, the, the poem you just referred to, I've never been able to figure out how I would read it. Maybe it's a, it's a, a three person uh, piece uh, performance, uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start from a different place uh, in the first section and it, it'll take me maybe four minutes to read this poem. Um, and it's connected and that's why I, I wanted to, to give a sense of of the sort of the bigger side of the picture. This is called um, Anthropocene Hymns. I'll read another one after that from the sequence, but this is called Anthropocene Hymns. One, the need for armaments as the world's remade in words, floating above the still waters. A fellow tribesman surveys the field for a hunt, seeking grasslands for grazing or a place to sleep among the trees. The air smells of pig, geyser spray, and miniature rainbows ripple above the lagoon. Two, the down of our nests, concrete and plastic, the project almost completed, taken over two million acres of desert lands, thousands of apartment blocks awaiting further procreation. The body politic must live without water now. Three, churn that spins and flows, the rumble of chains, the grind of confession, a tightening of the body's circuitry. Four, what is the difference between wolf and fox in the homeland? Is it possible for a bird to be two birds or four lizards. Some rise at daybreak, others hunt at night, a churn at the level of sea and moon, wolves and foxes, birds and lizards, but not a churn in the absolute. That would come later. That and the idea of value, an evolution of traps and scalping. Five, a clearing a flatness that is no longer a field, a burning plate exhaling its dust. Six, a copulation between these two verbs, learn and adapt, between two concrete towers collapsing. Seven, the seasons are at work on everything, even on themselves, an extinction here a mutation there, 
some sort of algae blocking the stream, suffocating the fish. The insect whose excrement is turning the Taj Mahal green to become a necessity, a new organic machine that separates flight from body and reserves the motions in pixels for reuse. Eight, to recall a certain hope as something so small that it can fit into a postcard of your hometown. In the long exposure, the boulevard is streaked with car lights, red going one way, white going the other. Nine, to be alive then with meaning in a far corner from one's thoughts and beliefs, to be non-human, non-bird, we have not gotten there yet. How to stop thinking of bodies as worth extinction, worth eating or enslaving, brought to whip or firing squad, the hovel, the burrow, the hive grown thin, concrete with bones and air mixed in, a history unfolding, words nourished on blood. Don't tell me we are not who we are. 10, the theater inside the churn, inside the big human cave, a faint smell of pig wafts through the vents. The chains await us like airplane seat belts. No place else to go. Nowhere but this earth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. God. Um, there's something sort of like folding cliffs, like sort of waves uh, of. Uh, in that in that poem and what i really love about this book is how many different sounds you've managed to put into it you know that you have these sort of tight um end rhymes and then you have these sort of you know almost just dis, uh, disassembled couplets and mm -hmm. and and then these very t these short tiny poems and there doesn't seem to be a, a restless in the overall structure of of it trying to hold together it just allows to exist in adjacency and so I feel like these early poems, like the one you just read, there's a, they're, they're almost like a, that moment in the beginning of a symphony when you get a prelude. Mm. Um, did, did you think of it that way? Because I know we're mixing metaphors of, you know, no, I mean, some, some I, writing. I, no, no, that's great. No, I, I actually, it, it, this poem was written before many of the other poems and it became a kind of a somewhat abstract, um, map, if you will, atlas, uh, but also a, a kind of um, promissory note. You, you're kind of alluding to these elements that are broadly speaking, but then, you, you know, almost, you know, the, 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 you know, there are images of people in chains that are going to come later. There are mm. images of, of sort of uh, environmental degradation. So in a way, it was a, a, a big, broad picture that sort of tries to cover the sweep of the of the book in many ways, and uh, and it's more complex and and not as maybe uh, easily uh, transparent as a poem or or not linear. So then the other the rest of the book can do more of that sort of more linear, even though it's a, a multiple sort of uh, visions. But I, I I wanted to have this sort of complex more sort of vision of the world that then the book sort of details gives offers in more detail that's why it sort of comes in at at, at the beginning of the book yeah, yeah it's in the first section do you, do you want to read one of the the, the, yeah. the later poems or one of the uh, one or two of the shorter poems yeah i'll read um i'll read um this is just uh I'll read the, they might take like maybe four minutes. So, uh, yeah, when it, a, big, this, a book this big, it's kind of hard to 
find out which one, which ones to. No, this is the this is sort of like the Moby Dick of poetry books. It's 140 pages. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, where, where's the where's the chapter in the middle where it's just the description of the, the ocean at night from uh, scene from the white the, the white whale? Yeah. Uh, so I'll read these two. One of them is uh, it's, it's, it's in tercets, but it may sound like a guzzle. And the other one is from a doctor's account. And so that's the, the tension of like really the musicality and then the sort of the flat prose. Uh, everything is in tercets. That's what the book is. In. Into the sea. Barely out of the jetty, the boat rises with every wave and from the back two or three fall into the sea. At sunset, the boat starts to lose air, fills with water. Mothers and babies fall into the sea. One side stays afloat. We cling to a rope, water up to our bellies, and people fall into the sea. All night we grip and bleed. Rain so cold, waves five stories high. If only I could fall into the sea. Sunrise, a helicopter, I find a red shirt, wave it to them. They watch us fall into the sea. They fling a small inflatable boat. I am too weak to reach it. Others try and fall into the sea. A cargo boat throws a rope to get us on board, alive at last, and we still fall into the sea. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just read this one more. Uh, this is from a, a report by a doctor who works for Médecins Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders. Uh, I just found this great testimony. I contacted her and said, can I, is it okay if I can make a poem out of this? And I, I was really just editing uh, what, she, what she wrote. It was just so... Um, uh, fuel burns, and this is true. This actually happens. Gasoline canisters leak or get knocked over. Gasoline mixes with seawater, and when the mixture touches human skin, skin begins to burn. Women sitting in the bottom or the center of the boat are at highest risk. Dinghies are fitted with plywood floors fixed with nails and screws that puncture people's feet. The wood soaks up water, expands and then splits. Women and children often fall through the floor or are trampled and drown. People fight on the boat. The bodies of survivors and the dead are full of scratches, bite marks, cuts, and bruises. But, that's, but it's fuel burns that horrify most. Survivors arrive hypothermic, dehydrated, barely conscious. They must shower with soap to get relief and need help stripping off their fuel-soaked clothes. But just touching their clothing can make latex gloves melt. Wow. Right? It's an amazing account. It's a great testimony. And so it was there. It was just a matter of tweaking it and uh, editing it and asking permission. Mm. John, I think it's your time to read. Yeah, and since you, you, you ended with a kind of testimony, I'll, I'll, I'll begin um, with one that uh, is sort of a true story poem. Mm. It sort of happened in front of me, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, the, this, this book, The Park, is set, as I mentioned, up in and around the Luxembourg Gardens, but usually every summer when I teach in the low-res program in Paris for, uh, for NYU, I spend a week in Sarajevo. And so I, after a reading, went back to the bookstore where there's always a party every night and standing there were three seven foot tall guys. <laughs> so I thought, okay, here's Vlade Divac, uh, Divac's brothers. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty close. <laughs> so this is this uh, poem that re resulted uh, from it. Um, and it kind of, you'll see where it connects to the idea of what a park is and yeah. who lives in a park. It's called, this is called the ex-basketball players. Mm -hmm. The ex-basketball players want to tell me what it was like playing youth tournaments during the war. 
how hilariously and inappropriately they were dressed. This guy was shot, they say, pointing to their point guard, now a conductor, a detail that produces roars. He has scars. For a moment, I think he's going to lift his shirt, the quietest and drollest of the group. Instead, he talks of an all-night drive back to Sarajevo in 1995 and how bandaged and bleeding into his uniform, he told the bus driver, I can't go back. Got out with three friends in Slovenia, 4 a.m. We took some sleep, he says, in the park and phoned a friend of a friend who asked how we were, three teenagers in a park at dawn. I had this much money in my pocket. We said, fine, we are okay, but two days later we weren't. We had just 20 euros. Our agent stalling. She didn't want us showing up smelly in Italy. So the friend of a friend took us in a few days. It was nice, showers, hot food, no shelling. But by day three, claps hands. That's it, boys. So it's time for our agent to come through and miraculously she does, we're on a train across Europe as if our homes aren't on fire. Sitting with travelers, reading newspapers as if our sisters aren't being shot. And for months, the agent, she shopped us around Europe, taking us to tournaments, tryouts. Maybe our price was too high. The four of us, it was fucking hysterical. No one wants a refugee on their team. We were like four monkeys on a rope. And that's when they all double over in laughter and form a circle and hug and someone changes the subject. Wow, that's a wonderful poem. It's a great poem. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just was standing in the right place. And I, the, the thing I, I wanted to be careful with with that poem was to make sure that it was clear where I was and where the speakers were. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's sort of, that was the biggest challenge for me writing it. Your poem that you read, uh, um, the Anthropocene hymns um, is, is, is really beautiful. And I, I was trying to do something similar, but through symbolism, um, mm. uh, you know, because one of the things I'm concerned about in this book is just the, the degradation of public space. Mm -hmm. And this, the, the idea that we can, um, any, any of us exist there um, and that it's being patrolled and certain peoples are being kicked out. Mm -hmm. And so to, to set the tone, I sort of began with the biggest kind of division between who is allowed and who is not. And it was between us and animals. Mm -hmm. and so the first poem in the book is called The Sacrifice. It goes like this. Mm -hmm. The difference between animals and us the main one is, they don't need to know it's a park. Mm -hmm. The coyote lopes through just the same, looking for food. We stop in mourning, sensing everything we've lost. We call that ceremony a park. Mm -hmm. So the, the park kind of follows the seasons, four seasons in Paris. Um, and, you know, as I spend time in the park and observe what's in the park, I start to kind of over here and, and, and look at some of its visitors. Um, and some of the people are, are people that don't want to be seen um, because they're migrants. Uh, so I'll read, um, you know, because this will connect to what, we, what you've been writing about, a poem called Visitors. Mm -hmm. I've counted six sides up Vogueyard, across Gunmeyer, a short bit down the Sass, the long stretch up Rue de Auguste, Auguste Comte. Sorry for my French. This is gonna be like a just car wreck of, of poorly pronounced French. I, forgive me, I'm from Sacramento. Um, <laughs> but to go back to the poem, uh, the long stretch up Rue de Auguste de Comte, then over the Boulevard Saint-Michel, down the hill of Rue de Medici, past Le Brostan and the Senat, where the guards stand with self-conscious weaponry. One side features blown up photographs of polar bears on ice, like all animals captured in the moment of being animals, bewildered, annoyed, saddened, one might think, by our need to record what is obvious, 
their home, what our looking has done to them, elegies to themselves. In the park, this violet hour of dawn, walkers, runners in the shadows of trees, men with backpacks and darting eyes look out sideways with similar glances, don't want to be seen, need to be seen. So we feel ourselves feeling their predicament. Two hours here, while the shadows remain, the men move on. On the other side of Paris, an exhibit depicts their home, which is nowhere. By nine, the Norwegian walking club gathers smart cross-country poles, bulging retirement portfolios. They'll be gone across the city, no exhibit, a man or two dirty enough to create the kinds of shadows that makes it easy not to see him. Mm -hmm. um, just because you're uh, Halid's the translator among others of, of um, Adonis, um, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm writing about in this in this book is this sort of um, uh, vector of history and how it's felt in, in places where history feels um, bracketed and yet history is in the, the uh, and it's not just in the air, it's in the materials that we build with, it's in what's missing. And um, Adonis I think is one of the world's best poets at describing history and poetry. So mm -hmm. I wrote this poem sort of in tribute to him, but also because as I was jogging through the Luxembourg gardens, I found myself at age 45 running behind a guy who looked like Adonis. And I thought, I'm really middle-aged if I can't keep up with a guy who's 90. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is that poem, um, Ghost. I followed him for five laps, uh, the barrel-chested, twig-armed man of 80 or so, tilting into his stride, white hair flowing, sockless sneakers coughing, across the crushed pebble paths. Each lap he'd go faster, arrow nose piercing the air until light around him bent. Trees unpeeled their arches. The sky revisioned its zeppelins, cavities carved by the war, refilled with glorious houseman buildings. The undead city around the park asking for forgiveness. Had they known if only they'd known how bad it would get. Faster and faster he runs until he's a mere streak of light. Paris becoming the undivided Jerusalem it once was. And he, Adonis, a poet racing to the beginning with no discernible lack of energy. Mm -hmm. I should translate this to Arabic for him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at, at some point I, when I was in Paris, um, I, I looked him up um, and uh, I, I was expecting him to sort of um, very, in a elder statesman way, brush me off. But he said, he wrote back and he said, um, I live over here, here's my address. If you'd like to have a coffee, um, just let me know. And I thought, Jesus Christ, like what happened to the, I'm, I'm too important to, to get together with the unknown American poets. And uh, no, he was, he was wide awake. I, I, Pollard, some of your poems are, dedic are, are in, are, if not dedicated, they're written to friends, friends of yours. Um, yeah. And some of them are also um, written after, uh, or in the spirit of um, uh, other poets some of whose names were unknown to me. And I, I wonder if like with the remaining time, if you could describe one of those poems. I, I had one that um, I read that I was just blown away by, which is uh, Shikwa, which is after Muhammad Iqbal, but you don't feel, have to read that one. If there's another poem you'd like to read, that would be great. I think it'd just be great to hear a translator talk about, you know, I'll uh, like read, Arabic. um, uh, <clears throat> In one uh, section, um, I'll, I'll, uh, this is a, this I guess is a nice poem. And this is uh, uh, in one a group of what they're high buns. They're not exactly high buns. They don't end in haiku, but they end in in a kind of renga. So I take the high bun form and then uh, form and then end it with a renga where I incorporate um, lines from different. Uh, poets. And so in this one, uh, where's the note? Uh, 
uh, on it. It I, there are lines from Kathy Song and Swinburne. I mean, that's a lovely thing about about sort of thinking. I'm I'm going to combine poets from different times and so on. So I I guess as much as this is a very sort of serious and maybe uh, you know sort of book of about impact. I had a, a lot of chance to play. And I think this is what, what and I play it in the art, artistic sense, not in the, uh, meaning I had real complete sort of freedom. And, and, uh, and so, so this is, I, I don't, I don't know how this fits exactly, but it is a kind of, I mean, by the end of the book, you want to redeem yourself and the world. And this is one of them. And so, um, the only one we have. Scientists have been studying the skeleton of one of our ancestors who was about 40 when he died. His skull shows that he suffered a serious injury to the left side of his head as a teenager, an injury so severe that he was most likely blind and otherwise disabled. As he matured, the right side of his body began to atrophy while the left side, being fed by the right brain, continued to develop. He could walk, but with a limp. The bones on his right leg and arm weakened and shortened. His right hand eventually shriveled to nothing. What is surprising is that he lived for at least two decades after his injury, which could have occurred while hunting a large mammal or in one of the turf wars he and his clan fought against their competitors. Scientists are certain, given his blindness and the severe headaches he must have suffered from uh, his head trauma, this particular ancestor could not have existed without other people taking care of him for two decades. His remains were discovered in a cave a few hundred miles north of Baghdad from the pollen found near his skeleton. Scientists hypothesize that flowers had been buried with him as with the others lying next to him. In the cave lit by a sputtering flame, they feed him summer's blue light, their hands rough and rank with rare flowers, the sweet seas loves and ours. Uh, so this was just, uh, uh, I mean, you know, finding this uh, ancestor and then in Baghdad, just so close, and then Swinburne and Kathy Song. So it was um, a way to redeem the human race with this kind of, it's, can, it's possible. We could still <laughs> take care <laughs> of the, the injured and it's the only way to go. So after all that damage, I guess. I had a, a similar feeling and, and cycle when writing the park in that I would go into the park looking for comfort out of um, sometimes fury, you know, and the time, what I was reading in the news. And some days I would, I would find things there that would only reinforce, you mm -hmm. know, when I would see soldiers kind of kicking migrants out of the park, yeah. it, would, it would reinforce what I sought to escape. And then other times the, the park would take its kind of green velvet wing and, and Put its arm around me and show me something kinder and i i found yeah, yeah. that in the course of writing this book i couldn't just simply beat the reader with um the state of the world you know because the world wasn't doing that to me and i hope the world doesn't mm -hmm. do that to, to to other people um entirely you know I, I, yeah. so I'll, I'll end by reading just two two brief yeah. poems that are sort of in that spirit of of things seen um mm -hmm. or things just that glanced off me. And mm -hmm. one of them is, is really, is another thing that I saw, which is I came out of the park and saw this. Charity. In the mouth of the church, two men, three women, picnic away from the rain. A man in rags beside them sleeping. Before they plate sandwiches, cornichons, fresh pears, cold meats. A piece of bread is broken from the loaf. Wine poured into a red plastic cup, placed by his body, care taken not to waken him. And I'll end with this poem, um, which is again a, 
which is prompted by the, the universe, um, which I know writing instructors tell you not to do, but um, I don't know. I think there, I love, one thing I love about Fugitive Atlas, Halid, is just the way that you constantly reassert the sovereignty of the body and that it's, it's not a drum for pain and it's not a drum for abuse. And, mm -hmm. and you do that across many different types of poems and in many different voices and um, in many different locations. And I just feel like that's, that's the one infernal thing in the air right now. Um, mm -hmm. um, that that the, the opposite of that is being said um, louder and louder because it's suddenly okay to say it in some circles uh, where it's been practiced obviously in, in many other uh, circles uh, for years. This is called The Folded Wing. The lone duck in the Medici fountain slips her beak beneath the wing and falls asleep, drifting like a hat tossed into a green pond. How good it feels to be one's own comfort, to discover all the warmth we need buried in our bodies. Yes, we bleed, we are broken, we get just one body. Yet there it lies most of the time, calling to us saying, rest here, lie down in me. I am more than less than you, even in a world that treats us as two. Mm. Yeah, and you rhyme. <laughs> well, I, I was I was so happy that, uh, to come across another another rhyming poet. Um, I feel like rhyme does something now. It it, it activates a a kind of mysterious coherence that doesn't need to be explained. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. I think it, there is a, a need for for a, a kind of solace that it brings out of chaos. So to end with it, at least, is 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 nice. Uh, should we uh, go back? We, we were hoping to end everything by uh, by nine, but uh, clearly we like to talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so Joanna, you can take it and thank you all for being so patient with us. I really appreciate your coming and being with us today. Yeah, thank you for giving up um, uh, the eight o'clock hour. Uh, hopefully you've, you've all eaten or have I have a I have a late eating time. <laughs> I was wondering if anyone had any questions, we could take a few more minutes. Um, if anyone from the audience wants to ask anything, if you'd rather ask verbally, use the little blue hand thing and I'll call on you that way, or you can write your question into the chat. Either a direct question or just something maybe you wanted to hear a little bit more about or just to say something. Well, I have a question for both of you. Um, could you just each talk a little bit about what you're working on now? What's next? You wanna do it alphabetically, John? Um, I saw the yeah, panic right. on your face. <laughs> I just, oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. On you. <laughs> Part of my panic is, is I'm working on so many different things at once. I just, uh, yeah, I, I had a I, feeling. Just say one of them, John. Um, no, it, part of what I, uh, I love um, talking to you, Khaled, is, is you are a curator, you're an editor, you're a critic and a teacher, as well as a poet. And, and um, when you ask me, Joanna, about what I'm working on, I, I have a list here. This looks like this. And these are all things I'm editing. Um, they're written like some sort of weird, like I, I'm trying to rob a gas station in, in Mississippi. Uh, and, you know, so I've got about nine pieces to edit this weekend. And that's sort of at the front of my list. But I can, I, I'd actually like to talk about some of them because, um, you know, some of these pieces, which will all run on LitHub, uh, they just um, make me happy to be alive. You know, one of them is by a writer that I published before uh, who wrote a short story about getting arrested um, for driving drugs across the Mexico border um, uh, and being a drug addict. And at the time, and the character goes to prison. Um, and at the time, none of these things had happened to the writer. Uh, 
and he was found in the slush pile at Granta. Um, mm. So Holland, you know, I don't know why they haven't published you uh, <laughs> because we did read the slush pile um, when I was there. I've, I left about seven years ago, but the, um, we published this guy who's an amazing story. His name's uh, Chris Dennis and Soho published his book. And then in, shortly after his uh, story ran, events similar to what he described actually became his life. So he has written an essay about that, um, about sort of imagining what became his life uh, in advance of living it. And wow. he turned it in just before COVID started and he's been amazingly patient waiting um, for this to come out. And then there's another piece by a doctor who lives in Ohio who was taking care of her father, um, you know, uh, who she's a, she was taking care of COVID patients and then her father got COVID in, um, in Long Island. Um, and so she's writing about learning about the disease while learning about its progression through her father's body. And mm. it's an extraordinary piece. Um, uh, and it's, I'm, it, it's taking a while to edit because it sort of does a lot of those really elegant um, cycles from abstract to specific, from sort of describing factual things to uh, describing intimate things. So that's sort of a, a, a glimpse of what's on my desk right now. But um, I just finished a, a new manuscript of poems uh, called Wind Trees, which is trying to push um, the framework of the park further out and that I'm in the park, I was trying to figure out how to write about space, public space. And one of the biggest divisions within it I found was between us and what is living but not human. Um, and so I'm trying to see what happens if I can write a space in which uh, human life is not at the center of it. You know, um, what, is, what does that look like? And what, is, what sort of um, movements happen to poetry? And it, it sounds crazy in Californian, um, but maybe it is, I don't know. Howard, what are you, what are you up to? I was just, as I was looking around the room, I'm looking with my issue, my most recent issue of Michigan Quarterly Review, uh, which I've been editing for four years. We just, um, uh, we just uh, released our fall issue, guest edited by um, uh, Reginald Dwayne Betts. It's, the theme is prosecution. And it's, uh, it's one of our best issues. So it, I've really enjoyed editing the magazine. Um, it's a thankless, thankless job, and there's always a fool who wants to do it. <laughs> That's me. But it is a beautiful issue, and I was just about to show it to you. Uh, there's a piece from Morocco, from a memoir, from a horrible prison in the 80s, uh, a piece by Ahmed Naji, who's an Egyptian novelist who was uh, imprisoned for uh, assaulting public morale uh, for having a, a, a novel with uh, some sex scenes. A uh, great uh, piece by Ravi Shankar about his imprisonment. Uh, uh, many, many, many pieces, not, not only about prison, but uh, forms of persecution. Um, poems from Somalia, from Uyghur poets, from uh, Eritrea. Uh, all over the world and the United States, of course. So it's been great to work on that. Um, um, I even you know after a book, you feel like you nothing wants to like even the pen stop working. It's like you know the pen is not refusing to work. The paper gets jammed in the in the printer. Uh, you know it's like it, or you're just sort of fed up with your own kinds of. I mean, it, there's for me there is no. Um, like uh, we start uh, quickly, um, but in addition to the magazine, I'm uh, I'm uh, translating some, and I'm still doing things with uh, with Libya in terms. I run a website which is international poetry translated to Arabic. So every day I have to. We have this website that posts uh, poetry uh, from uh, all over the world called Kasaid Lil Hayat, which is means poems for life and. And uh, I'm also working on a public awareness campaign about COVID. Uh, and we're producing a song about, uh, you know, the health workers in Libya um, who are 
dealing with the COVID cases. So I guess there's a part of me that always wants to get away from writing uh, and to, to get into sort of some kind of life uh, that's outside of that. But um, yeah, um, no, but there are, there are projects that are, uh, you know, like, like little birds uh, squealing from the, or, you know, singing in the, in the doors, but I, I <laughs> I'm not listening to them yet. Not ready to to be sucked into another writing project. So, and I think I'm just saying we have to a... plug in Grey Wolf. It's been so nice to have a, a publisher. I've gotten. I used to like uh, like there are four or five people that are writing me. We want to do this. We'd like to do this, and it's been a great, great gift uh, to, to have all of this support. So I'm, I'm just really sort of plugging the book as much as possible is what I'm doing. Yeah. We have a great question from Keisha Bush for both of you. I'm curious about the feelings you each experienced while working on your book of poems. Did the writing span months, years? Hmm. John? Um, this, yeah, this was years. Uh, I think I began it in 2016, 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, the weird thing, obviously, with books is they're turned in, and poetry it seems to have really long lead times. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've turned in a book that probably won't come out till twenty twenty two, maybe even twenty twenty three. But so this this book, uh, I, I think I was feeling despair mm -hmm. and and kind of anguish, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, I I guess it's not surprising to me that I'm writing about trees now, because <laughs> um, you know you can you sit under a tree and it's like this great big living thing puts its arm around you and, and says something silent, but kind. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I feel like I, I long for that feeling. It's the best, if, if you've, you know, been, been lucky in childhood, you, you, you remember that feeling from being a kid when, when a kind of adult would bring, bring you into a, an embrace. And the park was that thing to me. And so mm -hmm. it was a strange mixture of, despair and, and kind of anger and uh, a reminder of comfort. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what I was trying to do while writing these poems was try to figure out how do I, how do I convey those things simultaneously? You mm -hmm. know, because uh, I think the, the greatest despair comes from a flattening of emotion into one, one kind of commodified state. Like I am, I am sad, you know, mm -hmm. I, am, I am furious. I am angry, I am, I, you know, I long for something. And I think most of the time we're in multiple versions of that, you know, and I, I so I was trying to find a kind of cycle to get in so that all those things would have room and, and, and especially, but also love, you know, I wanted to figure out how to write some love into, into this time because it was the thing that kept me um, I don't want to make it sound dramatic, but it was the thing that kept me living, you know, love and friendship and, and um, the kindness and fellowship with the people I, I know and, and care about and sometimes strangers. So th those are some of the cycles of things and they can all happen in the public space, which is sort of the weird thing about a park. You, you run through a French park and you're like, I, I think I just saw penetration. I don't, I don't know, you know, they have been there for three hours, you know, what is going on there, you know, uh, and simultaneously that there's also uh, some proximity, you know, um, and it's just a strange kind of version of, of public life that happens in a park. Uh, does that answer your question, Keisha? I got lost in the answer. I can't remember the, the question, but uh, um, yes, this book took about nine years. And um, I don't know, I mean, I, let me just tell you that I could not let go of it. I mean, I kept going to cafe, even like going teaching, I took the draft with me. Sometimes I don't open it like for a month when I, I mean, we went 25 drafts, but I always had it with me. It was the, it was, I wanted to warm it with my body or vice versa. So it was always something that in a way I'm 
working on it by being in its presence. And, uh, and that's, I mean, sometimes that's like a, a very vague, but then once you open it, then you get into the, 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 the things that, that each poem is dealing with. And sometimes poems feel like the, 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 the it's, it's dry, like the, what is it, the, what is it called, the fresco, or the, the sort of the, it's dry and there's nothing to add. And then somehow it's a moist and humid day and you can actually re-begin or you just like, you know, scrape it all off, put it in a bucket of water and start over again. But it's hard to, to sort of decide to, I mean, revision is this, um, is this act of impulsive activity and patience because sometimes you have to be patient with a poem for, for, uh, for uh, several years. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, just opens up. So it, it, it's, it's really waiting for the poems to call you back and allow you to rewrite them, but you're, you're always with them uh, is, is how it went. Um, and again, you're, you're, you know, you're like, you know, does that make sense? Does that convince? I mean, that's the sort of the, the drama aspect of it, or poems are kind of promissory notes. Has this poem sort of delivered? Has this voice kind of convinced me yet? And you say you give it time until the voice begins to, to sort of uh, convince, and so it's it's not all just the process of the writing. It's also the process of, of uh, the poems coming to fullness, you know, fullness, or you figuring out what needs to be done. So I've lived with them uh, uh, all that time. I think the other aspect of it, and once you get very close to it, then you begin to uh, like. Uh, remove some and then add some and then say, well, here's what, uh, there is, an, uh, is, now I know what new poems I need to write for the manuscript. So it's been an, uh, a long uh, conversation. And, uh, and even if, you know, like if, if there's a combination of the creative moment, it's, it's not there. Then that, they know that it, it, you have to wait for it until it fulfills uh, its promise. I guess the, what I want is, is to always be able to look at the work objectively, if you will, or some detachment. I love you, but I want to, I want, you're not ready yet. I'm going to wait for you. So I, I just feel, um, I, you know, that moment, when can I enter it again as a, as a, a creator or as a writer? And that takes both, uh, you know, patience and also, but not full abandonment of the, of the poem. Um, we have a question from Mo Agrednik. How did you approach the movement of your books in terms of sequ sequencing? So really, I can't wait to hear Khaled's answer on that because I, your, your, the development of Fugitive Atlas, as you read through it, feels very natural, but I imagine it, it came from a lot of mm -hmm. subbing in and out. Um, I love, you know, the reading Fugitive Atlas, the it's a kind of book that you can you can walk up to it and walk away from it. And just like with a big mural, you some, sometimes walk over and you suddenly realize that there's this really wonderful detail about a face. Mm -hmm. And you see how carefully just etched a, a person's faces and, and it feels like you almost, you know that person. Mm -hmm. With a book like The Park, because it's um, written in this kind of, symbolic real register, I, I had to really think about um, the, the, the movement of the book as a kind of musical score that, you know, that there was no, um, other than the seasons, there was no obvious place for certain poems. And so there was no um, progression um, biographically um, because I was sort of writing out of that. Um, I, I wasn't in that register. Uh, so I had to come up with a different um, cycle but that sort of felt like escalation and transit, um, but wasn't uh, forcing um, a kind of, I don't know, prose logic on the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Mo, I wish I could give you an answer that's less mysterious than that, but I, I simply had to step away from it and hear it and look at it and then come back to it and figure out whether that was mm -hmm. making me feel like the the book began in one place and ended in a different place. And whether those movements within it were 
um, returning to the kinds of intimacies Khaled uh, talked about often enough so that I wasn't um, ever getting lost in a sort of soapbox period. You know, I think it, the title of this, this, this discussion tonight is really something I, I worry a lot about that, you know, the, the, that art will be overwhelmed by the desire to say something. <laughs> And that's when I, that, that's when the ordering was really keen, or uh, that looking at the order, Mo, was really a, a key thing for me. Yeah. I think in a, a similar uh, thought, uh, I, uh, there were, like there's the, 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 the high bond sequence, there was, there, this was going to recur. Uh, um, there is a the, be, poems called Beatitude that begin the book and end it and that appear, they sort of open the sections. Um, I guess in, in some ways, um, it was very important for me to, in addition to the rhyme and so on, to, to give the reader a sense that this is a, a made thing. Uh, this is not, it's, it's about reality, but it's not going to be replacing reality. I'm structuring these things in a sort of a, with a, with a, a symmetry in mind. Um, it's not ethnography. Uh, and so in a sense, um, it was very important to, to have ideas of orchestration to, uh, to, to it, the book is all in tercets. That's the only stanza form that's used in the, in the book. And so all of that is to maybe recall in the idea of uh, artistic uh, control and um, uh, to, to sort of shape these things up with the ideas of balance. The Beatitudes, I, I'm, I'm, again, I, I have no, I only know where they fit in the book, but I don't really know when I wrote them, or maybe I wrote them when I felt like I really need to have my daughter become to play a role in the book. Uh, it just seemed like, you know, it's sometimes, you know, I, you know, I, it's, it's very interesting to think of like when, or well, this is, it's a, it's a, t a terrible analogy, uh, but it's when do you need a companion in the book, like when did Dante need Virgil? Did he need it when the first canto, or did he just like let me bring him in? Maybe I can like crutch on Virgil and let him help me, you know, write this up. But I think in a, in a, in a sense, it's uh, uh, you know bringing in my 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 daughter was was not at the beginning of the book, but it seemed like here's a kind of muse-like conversation. Uh, somebody who takes us out, but also brings more intimacy to all of these stories, that these stories are being heard by a father and a daughter, uh, one who's assuming the world and one is middle-aged thinking about like, shitty world, I'm ready to get out. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so, um, so in a way it's that conversation about, um, uh, you know, the, the presence, of uh, of a, a voice to tell the stories in and seem to serve as a as an interesting framing device for the book. So um, structuring it with a with a with a with a with an awareness of of structure and a sense of of uh, 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 making the reader aware that this does not replace reality; it is a reflection on reality. Is also a way to to deal with 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 what John is saying: is that uh, you know how much of the world is exerting on the work or the desire to make a difference? Uh, yes, but it, art can't deliver that promise. It can only deliver itself in that sense. Even when you're dealing with the most urgent matters. Uh, art has to always deliver itself, not what it hopes to change, because it can't control that. Um, we have time for one more question, and I saw that Aliyah had your hand raised. Where did you go? Oh, oh, yes. Well, Khaled, you were you were speaking on, um, you know, what art can do and. I was wondering because you're both sort of reporting back to an American audience from different places. And, you know, as an American reader, I often feel kind of merely in the act of, of witnessing through the work guilt and uncertainty. And I know you were just speaking about, you know, what can art compel people to do, but um, 
I don't know if you could say a little bit more about that, about uh, both of you, about kind of what you hope, you know, especially in these times for American readers, what, you know, what does an American reader do after, after the book? Thanks. Um, that's a that's a huge question, isn't it? Do you do you want to tackle it first, Holly? Because you, your mouth opened. Yeah, and, and no, my mouth wrote. opened for air. <laughs> 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 I needed uh, as much oxygen. I I don't know. I mean, I imagine that. Uh, I mean, it, I don't know why it's an American reader or any reader. Um, um, what does the reader anywhere do when they read uh, a book about uh, any given experience? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think with America, we sort of feel the added pressure that we're like, you know, uh, I imagine that, that I, mean, I mean, you know, people, these people that are working in, in Africa and in North Africa, as a, you know, they're like living on, if they're lucky, they, you, they can send like a hundred dollars a month to their families to live on. I mean, and that's our money. That's like a hundred dollars of our money, which is nothing means a lot to so many people around the world that's and they needed to have our money it can't be like their money it can't be any other kinds of money so if we feel like oh we really are what role do i play or my dollars or what my dollars at work if that kind of signal is if they're if you, i'm pricking americans with that with that kind of notion that you know you're part of the problem 25 percent of the world's resources I don't know, 40% of the uh, pollution, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with the biggest uh, uh, exporter of the arms around the world. Uh, I, I mean, if, if, if that sort of comes up, that comes up, I don't think that that's a, that's a reality that Americans should know. Uh, so uh, if the book is a reminder of that or of a kind of a responsibility toward the globe and toward the rest of humanity, well, you know, we're, we're fucking the world up. I mean, let's, let's put it this way. And so, you know, if, uh, if, if this is what we say, that that's what we say. Uh, and the other fact is Americans, I think maybe, maybe uh, we have a sort of an inflated sense of agency, uh, like, you know, the, the, American kids are, have higher levels of confidence than any other kids around the world, but they do much better, worse in math than, <laughs> than most of the civilized world. They're very confident they'll get the, you know, X squared divided by, you know, uh, whatever, but uh, they're not. Um, so, uh, and in a sense, so we have an inflated sense of agency, uh, among other things, but at the same time, we, ha we are, part of the engine uh, uh, that is, um, that's corrupting. Okay, an unemployed American in our times, I mean, what are you gonna tell them? Uh, take care of the rest of the world? They can't even like pay the bills. So I, I don't mean that, but I also mean like as a, as a collective, uh, maybe if things get fixed in the United States, maybe if the economic structure that's oppressing Americans can also sort of fix itself and call, stop being such an oppressive force elsewhere. Maybe that's what it takes. And if, if, we, if we become more engaged locally, maybe globally we become uh, a, a better force in the world. Uh, so so we're, we're wounding ourselves and wounding the world with it. So I, I don't think the conversation is to make Americans feel necessarily responsible for this, but uh, the damage that they're feeling in their lives uh, seems to radiate outwards, and and I think that that's sort of sort of the relationship that that that's possible to have with that sense of global responsibility. I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. Um, if only to say that uh, when I was writing these poems, I was often in Paris teaching for NYU, and mm -hmm. it's really kind of thrilling to go from teaching and watching students wrestle with manuscripts to try to figure out what I'm supposed to do with my own. Um, if only because I feel like when you have a lot of people, this is going to be a terrible metaphor, but um, let's try it on. Uh, if you have a lot of people in a gymnasium, there's a kind of music to the bodies moving, working out, you know, it's like, it's like a not evil soul cycle. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like that being in class, you know, sometimes like when, when 
people are working on, you know, memoirs set in Brazil or Kentucky. It reminds me of the, that the greatest importance in writing is to make the felt real um, and to remind us what it feels like to feel. Um, and I, what Holland was saying, I think has an element in poetry that uh, having a kind of global setting to your book and using voices um, in, uh, is a solution to, which is that we live in a world where in the news, so much of the imagery you see of Arabs is people dancing in the street with guns or wailing at the sky after a, a bomb has been dropped. And yet every night in many cities across the Middle East, people make love, they, they make food, they sit silently and look out the window, they pray, they curse God, they drink whiskey, they drink water, you know, they eat cereal late at night, they wake up and they watch NBA basketball. There's just a, an enormous variety of human experience which isn't represented. Mm -hmm. And I think in, a, in, when writing books like maybe the, both of ours are, which, which are forms of trying to interrogate what, what social space is and what's there and, and what, um, what destroys it and what destroys the bodies in it, um, one thing that I hope Americans can take from it is that no body in, our, in the space in our books is more made for pain than another. No body is more made for abuse in these spaces of these books than another. And that in these books, hopefully, that they pay enough tribute to and, and love, I guess. They love the bodies that are in them enough, even while witnessing terrible things which are happening to some of them, they can make a kind of statement that doesn't anesthetize an American from the images that they're going to see in the news. Maybe in some part of the reptilian brain that connects to the heart, it will, it will be activated next time an image like that is seen or an assumption like that is made in a news article and the entire assembly of assumptions come rushing forth that they, they crave death, you know, they don't respect life. Um, I think books like Holland's, you know, it's so, so much bigger than that question. But if you read it, I don't think you could ever traffic in those assumptions again. That was a big sigh. I hope it was a good one. Thank you, Alia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations to Khaled and John Thank for you. your new books. We're so honored to have you here tonight. Thank you to everyone in the audience. Thank you. Um, I hope you'll join us again. Our next reading is November 6th with Claudia Rankin here on Zoom. Um, perhaps you could all unmute yourselves as you're saying goodbye to give some applause that the readers can hear and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Great quote, great uh, uh, motto, uh, Benjamin Alishire. Oh, it's not me, it's Brecht. I wish oh, I, no, I, I wish. When, he, when, when John was talking about trees, I think, <laughs> what is that line about writing about trees that Brecht said? I, I couldn't remember, but I was going to, it was this. this is, the trees one? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, it is about. He had, he had some zingers. He had some zingers. Was, yeah, he's, uh, I love yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for our website, you know, actually fa translating some Brecht poems to Arabic ah. uh, was uh, one of the sort of, uh, I, this poem needs to, needs to, uh, I mean, it's a, so, you know, this is what all it takes to start a, like a, a website of a Arabic poetry daily, sometimes a commitment of five years, mm -hmm. all you need to do is like one poem, one poem is going to tip you over. So mm -hmm. it was like, that one was... Uh, you know, it's like, you know, the editorial, editorial is also a form of uh, uh, delusion and, uh, uh, you know, 
a kind of fantasy. Somehow you just trip yourself. It's almost like you dig your own hole and stay with it for years because this is a worthy project. So one poem gets you to commit years of work for... I like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, well, thank you, Khaled. It's good to see you. And uh, we're, I want to be the last thank to leave. I, I, you know, but I think you should all go home. <laughs> <laughs> I we already go. are. We you already, already are home. home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You can't flick the lights on in the bar. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye, Humera. Hi, Keisha. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I, Thank I, you I, all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.